a lot of this conversation will be about how we can achieve Mayor Bowser's call to seize this once in a generation opportunity to not just reopen our city, but to build a more equitable DC. And uh, in terms of who this session is for, um, it's for everyone, um, including those interested in healthy food access, food justice, um, economic development, um, and, and everyone who keeps hearing all this buzz about CDFIs. Um, and also small business owners and entrepreneurs who are interested in financing ideas and strategies. Um, and really anyone else who's joined, we are happy to have you. Um, this session, it will be about 90 minutes. Um, please type questions into the chat box if you're able to. I'll be reading some of them off as we go through the conversation. Um, others will be read out loud at the end um, during the Q&A. Um, there'll also be time to unmute yourself and ask questions if you're joining by phone. Um, if you have a question that requires a more thorough response, please email us after the event. Um, you can just go ahead and reply to the reminder email you got this morning with any questions. Um, and just want to say that all questions and comments are welcome. We realize that some of you might be learning about this topic for the first time. Others are seasoned pros. Um, so no question is too basic. Uh, we will try not to use acronyms or jargon, but please call us out on it if, um, if we're talking about something that's not familiar to you and you need more explanation. So now I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, Olivia Rebinal uh, oversees the inclusive food systems work at Capital Impact Partners, which is a national community development financial institution. I will be using the acronym CDFI um, for brevity, based in Arlington, Virginia, with offices in Oakland, Detroit, and New York. Olivia oversees collaborative initiatives such as the Michigan Good Food Fund, which over its five years has deployed over $13 million in support of 280 food businesses in Michigan with a combination of technical and financial assistance. Olivia has worked in the CDFI industry for over 20 years and her background is largely in small business financing. Daniel Friedman is a loan operations officer at the Latino Economic Development Center where his responsibilities include supervising loan officers, implementing underwriting policies, developing new loan products and more. On the weekend, you can find Daniel working for Twin Springs Fruit Farm at local farmers markets, a part-time job he's had since high school. Uh, Lou Smith is a small business advisor for the Washington Area Community Investment Fund. He's a seasoned entrepreneur, investor, and business professional who works to build um, business, the businesses of entrepreneurs. Born and raised in DC, his knack for helping others to achieve began early on and it has stayed with him ever since. Giuseppe Lanzone is one half of the Peruvian brothers with his brother, Mario Lanzone. They serve authentic comida criolla, I apologize for my accent, the tastiest part of the Peruvian heritage rooted in Andean, Spanish, African, and Asian influences. The flavors that dominated their childhood in Lima are the tastes they crave most for moving to the United, um, after moving to the United States. They have, sir, they have several locations in greater DC, including in La Cosecha and Union Market. Jeff Miskiri is the co-owner of Po Boy Gym Bar and Grill, a Cajun Creole restaurant and caterer with two locations in on 8th Street Northeast and 9th Street Northwest. Jeff always want, had the entrepreneurial bug. So when he visited his great grandfather in New Orleans, and discovered the famous Louisiana style po'boy sandwiches, his first thought was that he wanted to sell them. Po'boys were largely unavailable in DC, but he suspected they'd be popular in his own town. Just recently, Jeff opened his third restaurant in Columbia Heights, which is called Creole on 14th. Check it out. Uh, so we're just gonna jump right into discussions. Um, as I said in the beginning, please feel free to add questions in the chat throughout, and I'll try to incorporate them or they'll be asked at the end. So I'm gonna start with a really basic question for Olivia. Um, for those who are new to CDFIs, can you describe um, what a CDFI is and what the difference is between a CDFI and a traditional bank? Olivia, you'll need to unmute yourself. Did we lose Olivia? Checking. Oh, there Hi. you are. Hi, we can thanks hear you. Thanks for having me. No worries. <laughs> well, um, thanks for having me. By the way, I'm glad to contribute. 
Um, community development financial institutions, um, there are about 1,200 of them that are certified nationwide. It's a designation that's given to us, organizations like ours from the Department of Treasury. Um, a lot, most of the CDFI uh, throughout the country are nonprofit organizations like Capital Impact Partners. And our charge is to specifically deploy capital into undercapitalized communities. Um, the Department of Treasury will uh, measure that and evaluate us and recertify us based on where our money is going. And our money is required to be delivered and deployed into quote unquote low income census tracts. As we know, that largely coincides with our black and brown communities throughout the country. Um, so in effect, most of the CDFIs are lending specifically into these communities. We have a degree of additional flexibility and risk that banks oftentimes might be unable to take because of their for-profit orientation, because of financial ratios that they are required to meet for their shareholders. Um, we as CDFIs will have a degree that, uh, of, of flexibility that banks might not be able to have. For example, at one of the CDFIs where I worked as a small business lender, we were able to lend capital uh, in excess of the value of the property itself. Um, many times banks will not even give you up to 100% of the value of the property, meaning if you're buying um, a new site for your food production line that costs $100,000, they might give you $70,000. But for um, some CDFIs, depending on their guidelines, they, it's not uncommon for them to offer up financing in excess of that amount and, and even more. And the purpose is really to be able to catalyze um, entrepreneurs and other development so that we can move capital and create communities of opportunity. Um, it will vary from bank to bank and CDFI to CDFI, but in general, there is a degree of flexibility that we can offer. Thanks so much for kicking us off, Olivia, uh, and we are thrilled to have you as well. Um, my next question is for um, Daniel at LABC and Lou at WACEF. So um, Daniel, you can answer first and then Lou. Um, can you describe the history of how your CDFI got started here in DC and how that's shaped your mission and investments today? Absolutely, uh, good morning, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, so LEDC started uh, in 1991 as a response to the uh, Mount Pleasant riots, or really the riots being the, the tipping point of a already precarious socioeconomic situation, um, you know, with just uh, neglected communities, um, you know, primarily immigrating from Central America only to be um, kind of shut out from the economy here in DC. And so, some unrest, social unrest, uh, led to our organization being started as a nonprofit, as well as I think the uh, Office on Latino Affairs from the mayor started at the same time. Um, so our mission is, is focused on Latinos, but it really means that we're all bilingual staff, staff uh, English and Spanish. Um, but our, our goal is really to, to help um, our, our clients build wealth and equip them with the tools so that they're able to grow um, you know, their own businesses or, you know, we have uh, different programs, I guess I should mention, um, around housing counseling for first-time home buyers. We have uh, tenant organizers uh, to preserve affordable housing, um, knocking on doors when their buildings are going up for sale. Um, and uh, technical assistance, you know, one-on-one -on -one for uh, free of charge with uh, business owners, workshop settings along commercial corridors, um, you know, helping, uh, I think the, perhaps one of our um, most uh, keystone uh, technical assistance programs kind of encapsulates our mission in that um, it's called Resilience Corridor, uh, Resilient Corridors. So, for example, uh, along Georgia Avenue, in terms, just in terms of gentrification or specifically like where the Purple Line is going, there's a lot of development that's going on, but the businesses that are there, the you know, mom and pop shops, the legacy businesses, minority owned, et cetera, 
uh, need to survive the change uh, in order to benefit from that revitalization. So, you know, whether that's decreased visibility or, um, you know, just the disruption of construction or gentrifying factors where it can help people um, make it through to, to you know, benefit and, and win in this economy as well. So uh, that's just informing our mission as, you know, as uh, captured in a community development financial institution, you know, we're definitely uh, looking at things differently than a traditional bank and have to expand upon that more as we go on. Thanks, Daniel. I'll turn it over to Lou. All right. Hey, guys, I think you can hear me at this point. We can. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, first, uh, we want to say uh, thank you for uh, having us to join the call here. Again, my name is Lou Smith. Uh, I'm from WACIF, the Washington Area Community Investment Fund. Um, we would like to first start off by just saying that um, this initiative, of course, is uh, long uh, needed within the city. Uh, and so we're very happy to be working on it and to get the chance to explain and dialogue with people about what we're looking to do here coming up in the future. Um, WACIF, of course, um, is uh, we were established in 1987, uh, just to give you a bit of history about the organization itself, uh, because we've undergone uh, certain recent changes here that have allowed for us to deliver uh, a lot of impact within the city, um, a lot of press being given to us recently in our local publications and um, a couple of other uh, kudos that have come our way. Uh, thanks to our uh, leadership and guidance under Harold Pettigrew, uh, who has uh, come on board within the past uh, four years, uh, and we've done a complete um, almost revamping of how we deploy our resources resources into the community. So at WACIF, you know, essentially we function uh, via uh, three uh, pillars. Uh, those are, you know, inclusive ownership, community wealth uh, building, and equitable uh, economic development. <clears throat> so um, at WACIF, if you you know take a look at our signature um, items that are uh, handled on a day-to-day basis, of course we deploy capital uh, into the community. Uh, maximum uh, loan amounts uh, right now at $250,000, um, SBA products and the like, uh, private products as well here uh, from WACIF. Uh, we have the Greater Washington, D.C. Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. Uh, there is the uh, D.C. Employee uh, Ownership Initiative. We have the 11th Street Bridge Park Equitable Development Partnership, um, which will be exciting to see, you know, um, go up. Also, the Minnesota Avenue Main Street Initiative. And so <clears throat> what we like to do, of course, is to have um, business owners to uh, come to us, <clears throat> excuse me, and via uh, online, of course, um, a simple submission allows for us to uh, bring you into the fold and to start the conversation with you um, as to you know, how we can uh, be of service to you. And right now, for the purposes of our discussion, uh, you know, with regard to um, how we are uh, deploying capital with regard to uh, food-based companies within Washington, D.C., um, because we, we do have a lot of inquiries. Um, so we'd like to just, you know, make it, uh, of course, um, uh, known that we are excited to work with everyone, especially from a technical assistance uh, standpoint or capacity uh, to help you expand your capacity and grow your business. Um, however, right now, we because of the conditions in the economy, we do have a bit of a pullback with regard to working with startups in the food-based uh, space. However, uh, there are already many businesses that are that are existing, existing uh, food-based companies that need capital. And we you know, love you, love to work with you. Uh, and just due to the implementation of our DC micro grant, uh, we are working with many existing food businesses right now, and we're looking to grow our food investment. And so as we continue this conversation, Let's think about those of us who may already be in business and have a location and, and those who are looking to expand, they have the experience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'd like to just put uh, platform that here in front of us as we go into this discussion, uh, because we're looking to make sure that we identify um, the right uh, group of um, entrepreneurs that we'd like to move forward with in the immediate. And then also we have the long term. Uh, which is inclusive of everyone, and hopefully we come out of the COVID-19 madness uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you so much, Lou, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my next question is for um, Giuseppe and Jeff, um, our um, local business owners on the call. Um, 
Can you speak to, can you both describe your decisions to start your own food businesses and how you financed those businesses, including how um, CDFIs were helpful? And I'm also noticing um, a few other uh, local business owners that I recognize their names um, that are that are joining today. If you wanna jump in on the chat um, and give your own personal in, uh, experience, we'd love to hear it too. Um, so Giuseppe, we'll start with you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be part of this panel. Um, we started Peruvian Brothers about seven years, over seven years ago now. Wow, we're getting all really fast. Uh, we uh, we started with you know our own funds. Uh, my brother and I, um, um, we started with one food truck. We busted our butts. We bought the second food truck after a year. Then we bought the third food truck, and everything was self-funded until we had the our opportunity to. You know, move to our first brick and mortar, and all of a sudden, you know, we're not talking about, you know, two digits. We're talking about three digits uh, before the before the comma. So to start a food truck, just to give you an idea, you need you know about seventy between sixty and a hundred thousand dollars to start a food truck. To start a restaurant, you need you know three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, and that's when we started looking for someone that could help us, like you know the great guys at LEDC. LEDC uh, Daniel was, uh, you know, everything that he said was exactly spot on to where the point that, you know, we, we, we talked to him, he guided us when I, when me personally was freaking out because we needed the money to open the, this, our dream, our dream restaurant. He was like, Oh, it's going to be okay. We'll expedite it. We'll take care of you on, you know, everything that he said came true. So it's funny that he's like, oh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll show comfort to the people. We'll make sure that everything goes through. We'll explain everything because, you know, for for a bit, I was calling Daniel more than my wife. So just calling him on and on and on to make sure everything was going on track. And he was like, yeah, yeah, just like I told you before, everything is going on track. So I guess, you know, in order to keep growing a business like like we did, we, we needed the help of of, of, a, of a bigger fish to be able to, to put exactly what we wanted in the right place uh, and, you know, be able to keep growing. Thanks so much, Giuseppe. Uh, Jeff. Oh, good, mo uh, good morning, everyone. So um, my situation was a little bit similar to Giuseppe's. Um, me, my mom, my first cousin, um, who are all our owners and partners of the business, we um, we had the experience working from a family restaurant as a youth for seven plus years. And um, we decided that we want to expand into the D.C. market and bring my great grandfather's concept of what he was doing down south here. So um, we were young, we were eager, we were excited, um, and a lot of business owners aren't aware about budgeting. So we thought it was going to be this easy fix, uh, grab and go, and um, we could generate money open right away. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. It took us over two years to do construction. We wasted all, um, excuse me, we, um, gen we used all our retirement money and funds and so on and so forth. My mom, you, you know, wiped out her savings account, IRA account, everything you can think of. So then we we hit a roadblock. We weren't we weren't finished. The landlord, just like every landlord in DC, wanted their money. So we just started. You know, we went to a community meeting that was on A Street, our first location. It was about eight years ago, and we came across a, another a local business owner, and he told us about Wasif. And um, his name was Dan. Excuse me. He owned a restaurant on A Street. He was one of the first ones on the restaurant on A Street. So he told us about Wasif. So. We, we know we we just just came at him very strong. We let him know our business plan, our pitch, our belief, our experience. And um, Ian Lawrence, who was the loan officer, Dan, he's no longer with the company. Um, he was just tremendous. He helped us. He guided us. Um, even though the landlord was threatening to put us out, he was he, he still funded us. And um, ever since then, it's been like a big brother, little brother relationship. Um, they helped. Economic also helped to expand with our second location. Um, so we always, we always credit it. That brother, the relationship that we need. How, where we came from or where we are now, and they continue to help us grow. So that's kind of our story, how we kind of got started and where we are today. Awesome, thanks for sharing your story, um, uh, 
Jeff and um, and also Giuseppe. It's really um, really valuable to hear your experiences. Um, one of the um, persistent problems and a priority of the DC Food Policy Council is closing the grocery gap and the food business gap here in DC. So we know that while wards three and six have an abundance of um, grocery stores and restaurants, um, war, other wards in the city like ward seven and eight have very few options. What role do, can CDFIs play in developing solutions to that problem? And particularly in building solutions that create wealth and ownership opportunities for um, underrepresented businesses. Um, I believe uh, Olivia, um, her computer crashed, but she's still with us on the phone. So Olivia, um, are you there? And can I turn it over to you to kick us off with that question? Yes, I'm checking to see that you can hear me okay. We can, you sound great. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that as we were mentioning earlier, or as I was sharing earlier today, we are slightly different. While many of our organizations are lending, in nature, we're very different from banks um, in the, to the degree we can take on a little bit more risk and we can also offer some companion um, and strategically aligned technical assistance. And I know that LEDC and WACIF both really excel in offering that. Um, when it comes to uh, entrepreneurs of color, what we know is that under traditional underwriting guidelines, they're less likely to look quote unquote credit worthy or bankable than their white counterparts. There are a number of factors that have really resulted in this paradigm, including um, many years of systemic discrimination resulting in the racial wealth gap, for example. Um, People of color are less likely to be homeowners than white counterparts. And as a result, uh, when they go into a bank for financing, oftentimes there's an expectation and our business owners in the line might have experienced this directly. There's an expectation that you might provide your home as collateral um, to secure a loan and to secure borrowing. Um, absent that piece of property, you might not be able to secure financing. Um, we also know things like credit scores um, tend to be more quote unquote poor, uh, uh, poor, poor ratings under a certain level for certain communities. And that also puts um, certain entrepreneurs in, at a disadvantage when they're looking for financing. So I think that there, uh, there are lots of complexities as it relates to um, entrepreneurs of color and accessing credit. And so organizations like ours are, are really focusing on and centering work with um, entrepreneurs of color. So Capital Impact Partners um, alongside LEDC and WACIF are um, delivering a program called the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. This is an initiative that is um, offered in a few different cities and in particular in cities where there is a great disparity in accessing capital by entrepreneurs of color. And um, in, in delivering this, um, in delivering this program, we're able to collaborate our capital and our technical and capacity building efforts to be able to really focus in and on, and develop and nurture and stabilize um, businesses that are owned by people of color. Thanks so much, Olivia. Um, Daniel um, and Lou, I'm curious um, if you want to add in on this, particularly around um, helping businesses open in underserved neighborhoods and also addressing the um, challenges with access to capital that uh, entrepreneurs of color um, are facing here in DC. Sure, um, I'll, I'll jump in here, um, thanks. So it, essentially, uh, some of, this is a two-part uh, solution uh, the first is education, uh, just around what's required and how to shape your loan package. And so the concept of loan packaging uh, for one to understand um, how to properly prepare the, the profile of their business, uh, their own personal profile and what documentation to have in order or what to so-called fix uh, prior to applying for uh, the loan is step one. And you don't necessarily receive that at a banking institution, of course, they just kind of want you to apply and they tell you, hey, you're uh, declined or you're approved they may go somebody if they care may go over with you rather you know how to 
uh, shape your profile to come back or apply elsewhere to, to then be approved. And I think one of the advantages of working with the CDFI, of course, is that, um, as, uh, well, I know at WACIF at least, uh, we are not credit score dependent, so there's no uh, minimum that's needed. We're more concerned with um, whether or not your um, uh, current trade lines are, or your rap, your current debts are paid. And so uh, we're not, uh, you know, cherry picking or let, let's say just say, hey, you have to have a minimum this or minimum that, but rather um, we're just making sure that you are um, uh, paid uh, and not late on your current bill. So if you have tax liens, uh, that's okay where that would may, uh, as long as they're on a payment plan and you're making sure that um, uh, that that is being satisfied, that's great. Um, of course, at a traditional lending institution such as the bank, that may be an automatic no or a turn away, depending upon the amount of those tax liens, et cetera, or sometimes the fact that you have a tax lien at all. Uh, also, if you are, of course, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you've had trouble paying your bills in the past, those past late payments that show there, um, we just want to make sure that you're caught up and things are moving along smoothly for you right now. So I think, you know, when comparing to traditional institutions, uh, there, there are uh, situations, and I've worked in commercial banking for a very long time, where exceptions are made and where uh, certain things are allowed to kind of go through with others, where you will find on a routine basis, uh, entrepreneurs of color are not given those exceptions. Uh, they're not given that advice. Uh, this is where CDFI step in to both help you to understand what an underwriter is looking for. And then, of course, we do have a bit more leniency with regard to the products that we offer so that you can be approved a bit more easily uh, when you compare us to our traditional banking counterparts. Thanks, Lou. Uh, Daniel, do you want to chime in? Yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely concur with everything uh, Lou put out there. Um, you know, around credit score, I, I like to emphasize that um, it is really just a number. And so we, we try and look at the report and, and find the story there. And there's, um, it's, it's really not that um, indicative of whether or not someone will pay you back. I've been able to make a loan, you know, it might be a much smaller loan, but someone with the upper 400 score and they have a perfect repayment history. So there's other factors that we're able to look at and, you know, figure out where we can start small and maybe build from there. Um, which makes me think particularly also about the, the food industry and what's good about it is you can start maybe uh, smaller with like we, we, our loan start at $1,000 for a seed loan, for example. You can maybe open up a catering operation. We developed a program uh, or a product rather, a food truck loan, where then you could kind of go the next step, get a food truck, um, you know, maybe have a, a couple months of just uh, interest only if you need to get it set up and ready to go or whatnot. Um, and then go for brick and mortar from there. So there's just kind of like uh, tiers that you can have a natural ladder um, in the food industry. And, and one thing that we've uh, been able to tap into three years now um, is the, it's called Community Economic Development um, Program. It's federally funded through the U.S. Administration on Children and Families Health and Human Services. But essentially we're able to help uh, D.C food brick and mortar businesses uh, expand with a 0% interest loan, as long as it's uh, providing uh, employment for low income individuals and there's certain benefits expected, um, you know, whether that be, you know, the sick leave or vacation time or, um, you know, profit sharing or transit benefits, you know, the list goes on. But to ensure that um, they're employed, they have, you know, stable schedules, uh, flexibility, if they have a family emergency, something like this, so that the job creation is there and, you know, they're benefiting from it. And the idea being that, you know, maybe you can go into a, a food business and be a busboy and then become a, a host and then a waiter. And so there's a career growth um, for the workers as well. The entrepreneurs get to access a loan at 0% interest. Um, we're able to support the whole community in a broader way. So it's kind of a win-win all around. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that as kind of one of the, what's in our toolbox to try and make these things happen and, and push them, you know, further into the, the neighborhoods that are historically disadvantaged. Thanks so much. Um, that's really helpful. Uh, Giuseppe and Jeff, I'm wondering if you can talk to your rationale for opening in the um, the areas that you've chosen to open your restaurants in and um, 
any like challenges you um, imagine you might have faced opening in um, underserved parts of the city that um, don't have as many restaurants like um, parts of Ward 5 and Ward 7 and 8. Um, Jeff, do you want to go first? My reception was a little in and out. Could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. I was asking about your um, choice to open in the locations that you've opened restaurants in so far and kind of how you picked those parts of the city and any challenges you um, might have run into if you um, had opened in um, wards five, seven, or eight, where there's where there's less restaurants. Uh, well, the challenges that I really had was, um, well, excuse me. The reason why I chose those locations because you know I, I really did my research to see the development that was coming in those areas. Um, a Street, when I was there, there wasn't any Whole Foods. And, um, I'm now I'm hearing there's plans for Amazon to come there. Um, uh, the incubators, all those. All those condominiums, apartments, they weren't they weren't actually there. But I, I saw the div diversity. I seen the streetcars coming. They was actually starting to do the construction. So I was like, wow, this what is going on here? Like this street has all the potential in the world. So I kind of just did my research. I drove up and down the street for like 30 days before I even signed the lease, and I seen how people were bar hopping and and getting food and a lack of food um, in the with the area where I chose. And I felt that you know this can really be something special. Um, the, the the strip that I chose, there there weren't actually any sit down restaurants there, so I was the first sit down restaurant on Eighth and Eighth Street. Um, then I kind of just kept doing my research. Uh, the Shaw the Shaw neighborhood, I seen the Whole Foods development coming there, a lot of re um, Atlantic Plumbing Building, um, JBG, you know, all the big time real estate company uh, leasing companies going there. So uh, you know, I just kind of piggy piggyback there, and then uh, with my new restaurant um, in Columbia Heights, it was kind of like, hey, like. Because of my hard work, my team hard work, excuse me, and the hours that we put in, it's like people are now reaching out to us and saying, "Hey, could you bring a concept here?" And so that that's kind of how 14th Street came into came into play, and we been open open for um, 45 days, and it's been truly amazing during COVID and all. It's been a wonderful success. We have outside seating, we're following the rules and the guidelines, um, and people just enjoying it. So um, I kind of just you know I try to go where there's where there's, there's competition, but not too many, too much competition, because um, you know Louisiana Creole Cajun cooking is uh, one of the biggest cuisines in the world. So to have that in D.C. Um, and not have too much competition doesn't really matter where I go. I just like to do the research. I want to give people. I like I like to give people jobs and opportunities. So I like to go in the areas where people don't have any jobs and opportunities, and we just want to continue to grow. Thanks so much, Lou. Um, I do live within walking distance of one of your restaurants and very much enjoy uh, being that close to it. <laughs> <Jeff. Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Giuseppe, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, that's a that's a great way to uh, that's a great uh, way to do some research. We uh, when we opened our first restaurant in D.C., was uh, after we, you know, we've been we've been roaming the streets of DC for seven years with the food trucks, and we know we knew the numbers, we knew what to expect, we knew what we wanted to add to the menu, which was the rotisserie chicken, the the, the yuca fries, a little wider menu. We knew that we wanted to add alcohol into our into our menu, which we did, and we had the opportunity to go into the Union Market District that they already had a very successful market there with Union Market and our landlords were Edens, which they already have, you know, when you do something once, it can go really well or you can learn a lot. And then once you do it again, which it was the La Cosecha, I think they did a, an incredible job putting it together. Um, so we knew that we were gonna, not going to be by ourselves and we knew what we were going to be learning and seeing how other uh, restaurant people Restaurant tours um, build their their kitchens and build their menus and how they did things. So that's been helping a, a lot. Even though we were we we're probably one of the first ones that that opened at Lago Secha. Some people are, st are still opening at Lago Secha, but we were one of the first people. And you know, we've been, we've been we've been learning a lot from people in their teams, the owners, the managers, uh, people that are working on the line. Uh, it's it's great that to be part of of a bigger market, and I think. Uh, Northeast DC is a place where, you know, the more Ukraines you see, the better it's going to come out. There's just cranes left and right. There's literally five or six constructions, huge constructions going around 
within two or three blocks of La Cosecha. So I think that's going to be a, a really popping place comes, you know, a year or two when everything is developed and everything is filled with people. Thanks, Giuseppe. Um, so um, I wanted to talk about an exciting collaboration between all three CDFIs that um, are on our panel today. Um, the DMV Good Food Fund um, was announced earlier this summer, um, specifically a innovative response fund as part of it um, to help businesses that have been affected by COVID-19. And it builds on some of the successful good food funds that exist in Michigan and California um, under the management of Capital Impact Partners. Um, so I'd like to ask, um, start with Olivia and ask, um, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from some of the other good food funds that you um, have, uh, that, that Capital Impact Partners has managed in Michigan and California? And um, what do you hope for the DMV Good Food Fund? Um, how could it be different from other funds and, and um, where is it going? Thank you. Um, our work in, in the district as it relates to a food fund initiative really builds upon our relationship, ex our existing relationship with LADC and WACIF uh, through the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. So it's within that paradigm that we're thinking about focusing on food, food entrepreneurs and food systems. Um, in our experience in overseeing statewide initiatives and this kind of work, we note that food, food financing, food systems is not very easy because there is not one size that fits all. The food systems can include uh, restaurants like those that we're featuring today, but they can also include um, production, distribution, retailing, and all of those different subsectors within the food system will require different kinds of financing, different levels, different sizes. Um, some projects will require smaller amounts to acquire some, some equipment, but other processing facilities, for example, require a whole facility and a whole um, uh, large equipment line. And so that drives the dollar amount up. What we know is that not one institution is well suited to serve that entire range. And so we approach the work in a very collaborative format where we bring together key partners that are able to help us deliver um, products and services all along a spectrum and a range. So I know that WACIF and LADC really specialize in small business lending. And that is why they are our key partners in the Entrepreneurs of, Fund, Entrepreneurs of Color Fund and are imagined to also be key partners as we move forward with the food systems financing initiative in the region. We also know that there are larger dollar amounts that might be needed for, say, facilities. If um, an incubator kitchen site needs to expand to another location, that would be larger dollar um, lending amounts that organizations like ours um, would be able to help finance. Another component that needs to be brought to bear in an initiative like this is all the technical assistance and all the support. Um, I think both LADC and WAKE have talked uh, talk about the service they provide with their business owners, the navigation through systems. Um, through our other experience, we craft specific boot camps, seminars, accelerator cohorts to focus on specific elements of food systems um, that would benefit entrepreneurs. Perhaps it has to do with merchandising, inventory control, and per, um, point of sale systems for a small community format retail retailer. Um, we also have focused on uh, specialty production, how to um, how to make arrangements for co-packing or co-manufacturing, labeling how to create relationships with distributors that will get you into retailers and how to promote your product. Um, so there are, are, are really a range of different kinds of technical assistance that, and seminars um, that we can really be able to offer, leveraging the expertise of partners. I know that LADC and WACIF already offer a good degree of technical assistance and support in specific for um, for food entrepreneurs, um, and I'll let them talk a little bit more about it, but um, 
part of the innovative response fund that we issued offered up support for these organizations to continue to work deeply with food, food businesses so that they can pivot in this time of COVID um, and, and to create sustainable revenue lines in the future. LADC, for example, has their food adventure initiative that offers workshops for local businesses. Um, and they do a lot of intensive coaching to a cohort um, support. We, we've provided some support for them to continue that with specificity around repositioning businesses to keep them running. I know that WACIF offers um, a program called Ascend Capital Accelerator, um, and they really work with entrepreneurs to provide some deep technical assistance throughout that program. And our support with them will help them create um, some loan loss provisions to be able to deploy more loans to food entrepreneurs. Um, so we imagine that like in our experience in other regions, we need to develop a collaborative. We need to uh, strategically align technical and financial assistance. Um, and we need to bring together key partners that have excellent rapport and relationships in the community so that we are able to reach the entrepreneurs that we're targeting. Thanks so much, Olivia. Um, I also wanted to mention before um, asking Lou and um, Daniel to um, elaborate on the TA um, that they're providing through this um, fund, that um, Capital Impact Partners, in addition to LADC and WACIF, also other recipients of the Innovative Response Fund funds um, include Crossroads, Community Food Network, Dreaming Out Loud, and Eats Place, um, some of our other um, really amazing uh, TA providers um, for food businesses here in the city. And we promised not to use acronyms. TA stands for Technical Assistance um, and um, basically means um, help in addition to, uh, or I'll let uh, maybe wake up and LADC describe um, what TA means for them. Um, Lou, do you wanna go first? Sure, sure, thanks. Uh, yep, so TA, technical assistance, and uh, of course we kind of have, have our own language speak um, in the industry here. So I'll try to stay away from the uh, acronyms as well. Um, uh, Olivia gave a fantastic breakdown and uh, the pros that she mentioned are really the reasons as to why we're excited about the Good Food Fund and especially with its history being implemented in other metropolitan areas. Um, there are many points um, or many types of food-based businesses and like she uh, mentioned, uh, they oftentimes go ignored, I guess, in the, in the broader, uh, within the broader scheme of things. Our restaurants tend to dominate the conversation uh, tend to dominate because they are more plentiful. Uh, but of course, we do have um, a specific need. And, and I can also say, you know, I'm a native Washingtonian. I grew up here um, in Ward 4, but I have, of course, friends and family who were in Ward 7 and 8. And in those wards, uh, it was very, and even in Ward 5 to a degree, uh, very hard for you to find uh, options for eating. There were really just, you know, certain types of uh, places you could go to and, and that was it but in terms of grocery stores uh good quality grocery stores with your fresh produce uh, uh, those were kind of far and few in between uh, you maybe had to go outside of the city or travel far away and for certain people in those areas of course if they didn't have transportation riding the bus and such just to go to the grocery store may have been a, is a lot right um additionally if you are a manufacturer of a food product and and you know we've had a couple of uh, great products that have come uh, through uh, WACIF recently. Uh, one um, uh, just comes to mind, uh, a young woman I spoke with, uh, this was maybe a week or two ago. Uh, she is uh, in uh, 80 uh, grocery uh, stores at the current point in time. And um, she started really just uh, from, from scratch, you know? And now she uh, has distribution in, in uh, regional distribution that that is, and she's growing. So. Um, her need, of course, along with strategic planning, was to receive uh, funds uh, to uh, carry out or to perform on her new purchase order uh, as she had just received funding uh, uh, to uh, purchase equipment to increase her capacity to fulfill that purchase order itself. 
So, you know, that's so we have um, production or, or manufacturing, uh, retail, we have the restaurateurs. Uh, and so um, for the Good Food Fund, for us at least, you know, we're really excited about being able to help entrepreneurs in all aspects or in all types of food based businesses here. Um, and I'll talk a bit at the end here with regard to our recommendations for them. Uh, but, you know, the Good Food Fund, at least for us, is is a great thing because we're now able to hone in on one of the most uh, prolific or the most popular sectors within our economy among entrepreneurs. Thanks so much, Lou. And I did see a question in the chat around, um, and I saw Olivia, you um, provided a great answer, but just for the benefit of everyone who can't see the chat, there's a question about... Um, uh, from Melissa, how is the Good Food Fund different from the local CDFIs that already exist? Um, so I can um, maybe briefly kind of paraphrase what um, what Olivia wrote in her response, which is that the Good Food Fund isn't a new CDFI. It's a project, a collaborative project um, with Capital Impact Partners, LEDC, WACIF, and the other TA providers I um, mentioned. So um, it's a new project and it's the first time here in DC to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, that we've had CDFIs collaborating on a food specific fund. So as opposed to the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund, which benefits entrepreneurs in lots of different business sectors, um, this fund is focused on food businesses. I'm getting a nod from Olivia. Um, great, um, Daniel, did you wanna chime in um, in terms of LEDC's um, role in rolling out the Good Food Fund? Yeah, definitely. Um... So yeah, I just wanted to uh, yeah, touch on our, our food venture initiative, which is um, what the funding is, is going towards. So our first uh, iteration of that um, was a series of workshops and, and a cohort of you know, business owners. Um, and the workshops were around you know, finance and, and marketing and you know, various topics. Uh, we were helping the entrepreneurs get their food manager certification. Um, we had a, uh, you know, tasting event um, when we brought in different professional chefs and restaurant consultants and managers and shared kitchens and whatnot, the health department. Um, and so with this fund, though, we're uh, pivoting, of course, with, with COVID and helping um, business owners figure out how to navigate um, this, this new environment that, that we all have to deal with. Um, so, you know, some, some things are a little uh, more obvious, like I think uh, legal advice in terms of lease negotiations is, is a big sticking point right now. And as an aside, I did want to mention an op-ed that we did sign on to, um, penned by one of our clients that I meet in the Washington Post about this landlords and this dynamic of not being able to, you know, operate at 100%. They've got to pay 100% rent, not exactly fair. Anyways, that's an aside. Um, but I did want to share uh, a link to a survey because we are actually developing this program right now and it is open for feedback from um, you all in, in the audience and, and everyone in the community to let us know how this program you know, can be crafted so that it's the most effective. Um, so I'll put that link in the, uh, in the chat as well as um, perhaps a link to our just uh, food initiative page so that anyone who wants more information can sign up and, and get that. Perfect. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, Jeff and Giuseppe, um, can you talk about if you've taken advantage of any of the technical assistance that CDFIs offer? Um, Jeff, I'll start with you. Well, um, uh, not at the moment currently, but um, I'm, you know, when you're in the restaurant, you're just in daily, day by day. You, um, so I'm taking my notes as you guys speak right now, so I know what I have to do when I have, you know, my free time to definitely, because it definitely can come in handy, especially with stuff like you said, lease negotiations and having assistance with that. That's very important, very, very important um, because your lease is everything, especially when you um, own a restaurant or a business. So <clears throat> I always, even though I've been in the, in the industry for over 15 years, I always go to each and every seminar that I can just because, you know, with um, knowledge, you, you never know what, what you might pick up, what, what's new that you might learn. So I will um get on top of that and you know use the resources especially since i'm growing I'm, i have a lot of more projects coming i want to make sure that i have you know the strongest team possible and um access all those resources when it comes to you know lease negotiations and so on and so forth especially with what's COVID, what's going on with COVID. so it's very important 
Thanks. And always nice to hear that even successful uh, business owners are learning something from this call. Um, so that's great. Um, how about um, Giuseppe? I think Giuseppe had to run because he had a catering <laughs> job to sell in his lap this morning. <laughs> I, 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 I'm here too. Oh, oh okay. I can... great. I just I just went from uh, I went from my computer to my phone and now I'm loading up. Too we have, we appreciate your dedication. Are you still there? We might have lost you. Um, well, while while just said, oh, you just muted and unmuted. If we can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, there you are. We can hear you. Sorry about that. I had to change from my from my laptop to my phone. Because we had a last minute uh, catering, so we we're just making it happen. <laughs> the life of a restaurateur, love it. Yeah, you know we have to. It's, it's you know usually when we have uh, uh, usually we have a person that does the catering, does everything. But these days, since we don't have a lot of volume. We like to allocate people where they can do best. Wonderful. Um, so Giuseppe, have you taken advantage of any of the technical assistance that the CDFIs offer? Uh, you know, we're always in the learning period. Uh, the, fun, the, the the thing about being an entrepreneur, I guess, is that you know you have to do a lot of things at once. But thankfully, we have a, a good team at Peruvian Brothers. So if I can do it, um, my wife helps me a lot. She's uh, a little more on the technical side, and she's the one that you know follows up. And you know, if, if there's anything, we're always looking out for getting more information and and getting to know everything better. Um, you know, the one thing that, we, that, that it will help us a lot would be to um, get sort of like a cheat sheet or a, a place where we can always go and get this information. Thank you. That sounds like a great next step for, uh, for us. Um, appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I know. Oh, your sound broke up again. Are working not so much from uh, working a little more in in their business rather than looking at their business, especially in these times where you know everybody has to be hands on at, at seven days a week. <laughs> right, right. Um, great. Thanks so much, Giuseppe. Before um, uh, the last kind of um, topic I have on my list of questions is around um, a, res a response to COVID nineteen public health emergency, but um, maybe before jumping into that, I did want to um, ask some of the questions that we've seen in the chat. Um, there was a question about, um, I'm, I'm going to ask the question, but then I'm going to invite our, um, our panelists to, to feel free to answer a slightly broader question as well. So the specific question was, how about funding for non-traditional ag production systems? agricultural production systems like aquaponics, um, seed funding for soft costs, 200,000, or then full project implementation between five and 20 million. Um, please feel free to answer that, but I actually also see a few other urban farmers on our list of participants, and I'm sure there will be others that listen to this on the recording. So in general, like what are some financing options for um, farm businesses in the city? Uh, any of the CDFIs want to go first on that? Sure. Uh, this is Olivia from Capital Impact Partners. I'll just share that um, the USDA is a federal agency, it's the United States Department of Agriculture. They offer guarantees on loans, which is supposed to incentivize lenders um, to be able to loan for production provide financing for production facilities. Um, in order to participate and get that guarantee, of course there is a process and you have to apply and be certified. Um, I am unsure of what regional local CDFIs have that uh, certification to do USDA guaranteed loans, but that is one avenue that we see a lot of our production um, borrowers use through their lenders. Um, we at Capital Impact 
once had that certification, but do no longer have the ability to do USDA guaranteed loans. Um, so if, on the question of production, it certainly falls within our lending, within the food system um, spectrum, and we would want to include it um, and provide the appropriate financial and technical assistance to support production. Um, production does have some very specific products available to it. So I think that it would be, um, we would be looking to be able to leverage regional, and I say regional because I, I'm not quite sure if we do have any local CDFIs, but I am aware of a Virginia-based entity that does do um, USBA, USDA lending as a CDFI. Um, we'd wanna leverage that ability. Um, on the topic of seed and, and startup um, funding, I think that various lenders will have a, a, a different approach to whether or not they offer that kind of financing. In my experience, I see other types of lenders that are not banks or CDFIs that are providing seed capital to these kinds of projects. Um, on the implementation side, if you're building a facility, I think that that's, um, especially if that facility is located in a community where we are really focused and prioritizing, and it, if that facility is also hiring from within that community, um, I think that it would draw a lot of interest from CDFIs and, and, and even banks. Thanks, Olivia. Um, Daniel or Lou, do either of your, have either of your CDFIs invested in any farm um, or food production companies in the past? And are you open to it in the future? Sure. Yeah, if I can jump in first. Um, the LEDC is actually a, a USDA certified rural lender. However, uh, right now, just in the state of Maryland. So I think worth mentioning since a lot of, uh, you know, sure in the audience might live in Peachy County or, you know, whatever in the area. So I wanted to throw that out there. But um, yeah, I mean, we're definitely open to working with um, farm businesses, of course, um, something that we anticipate as well as we opened our Puerto Rico office uh, last year and a lot of opportunity to do that. So it's something that we're looking more into as we continue developing. Um, but yeah, in terms of that specific question, uh, our loan maximum loan amount is 250,000. So I think for those larger projects, uh, perhaps uh, you know a different loan product or, or lender might be a better fit. But we can help you start small for sure. But micro lending is our our bread and butter uh, still. I think our average loan is like 13,000 or something of that nature. So great, Lou. Yep. Hey, there. So uh, with regard to farming, uh, that is something that we have uh, taken on uh, prior. Um, and with regard to food production, that is something that we will consider. Uh, yes. Um, most importantly, we are concerned with, uh, from an underwriting standpoint, the current operations. Uh, right now, as I mentioned prior, um, we are um, a bit uh, reserved with regard to taking on startups. Uh, at this point in time, just due to the nature of the economy. Uh, however, if you are currently producing uh, a product, then we are more than willing to uh, work with you and to take a look at um, how the operations are situated at this point to see if you are positioned for the influx of capital to provide the growth. Great, thanks so much. I also wanted to mention on the topic of agriculture, um, number one for um, farmers and everyone else on the call, if you don't know, um, there's a new director of urban agriculture and office of urban agriculture for DC. Um, it's housed within Department of Energy and the Environment and Kate Lee is the director. Um, and um, I um, will also mention that there's a new, um, relatively new in this last farm bill, it was created office of urban agriculture in USDA. So. We're really hopeful that um, having um, that staffed um, will, will lead to more focus on urban agriculture on the USDA level. Um, and DC has applied for some federal funding from that office as well. So more on that soon, maybe a whole nother panel on that soon. Um, but thank you so much for the question. Um, 
Another question we received is, um, I'll just read it. As I prepare to build mixed use development in the district, I'm attempting to nail down financing ahead of time. Lenders, including CDFIs, have responded that a lease is required for financing, even pre-COVID-19. I've seen multiple shell build-outs, um, maybe whoever answers this can explain what that is, um, in operational co commercial spaces, like the shops at Dakota Crossing, for example. How are they able to finance their food projects? Any CDFIs wanna take a crack at that one? So I think the question is around real estate development and how to complete a project and deliver um, del deliver units um, that are built up to shell, which is basic. Um, but basically, um, you have your sheetrock, you have general walls, and it's a it's an open canvas for a potential tenant. It's not built out for a tenant. And it sounds like the question is, how does even a developer get it up to that level and build it out to that level if they don't even have a tenant signed up? Um, developers, real estate developers will have um, financing for their overall project that will include usually an, item, an itemization or a line item that will allow some some of the proceeds of their financing to bring those tenant and to be leased spaces up to um, sort of a basic minimum level in order to prepare it to be shown to potential tenants and to secure a, a, to secure an ultimate tenant like a food business, a retailer, a market hall, or a restaurant. Um, but within the real estate developer's budget, they will usually have a small portion of it that can be allocated to prepare that space for lease, even if they don't have space yet. I will say that um, to be able to access that kind of financing, a bank will expect you to have already a portfolio that you've already developed uh, projects before, and that is the basis under which they would offer you more financing for your next project. So. Um, in, in response to a couple of things that we have noticed as we ourselves are a real estate developer lender, uh, we realize that that market is typically um, overwhelmingly occupied by um, white individuals, white men, or development teams that do not have um, the presence of people of color on their teams. And we've created a program to build capacity among people of color to become real estate developers. Uh, we have just completed our first cohort of, um, of real estate developers of color in DC, and we have graduated three cohorts in, in Detroit, which is really where we launched the, the program. I'll place a little bit of information about that, but through that cohort over three or four, a four month period, um, individuals that have less experience or a smaller portfolio with real estate development are given access to mentorship and curriculum and guidance as it relates to financing in order to um, co successfully complete their their next development project and i do think that one of our at least one of our participants in that program is um is part of is in our audience Great. Um, thanks so much, Olivia. Um, and yeah, if anybody in the audience um, wants to um, put more information in the chat or um, unmute yourself and chime in, just um, give me a heads up. Um, I'm happy to loop you in on the conversation. Um, so I wanted to um, spend our last bit of time, and, and we can still continue answering questions that are in the chat as well, um, talking about the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, I know, um, you know we know that um, it's been economically devastating for many small businesses, particularly in the food sector. Um, the Restaurant Association and Metropolitan Washington's website lists over 125 closed closed restaurants in the D.C. area, which is likely an undercount um, conservative. Um, can 
Um, I'll start with the business owners. Can you talk about how your business has been affected and how you've adapted um, to the public health emergency? Um, Jeff, I know you, you, you touched on this, um, but maybe you can elaborate. And um, to the extent that your partnership with a CDFI has been helpful, um, can you talk about that as well? Um, so we can start oh, with yeah. Jeff and then Giuseppe. Go ahead. Yeah, so so the the main thing is 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 the dining seat, and even though um quote unquote we're on phase two, 50 percent capacity, a lot of I mean a lot of people still uncomfortable with dining and seating. So so I mean to go orders is doing well, but um when you're full service restaurant and you have you know your bar and so on and so forth, and you're expecting to make generate money off of that because you know the you know the real estate in DC is so high, it really it really causes effect on us as, um in terms of that aspect of our business, but um, geez, I'm sorry, my video I actually pressed the button, but uh, I mean, all we can do is follow by the rules. I mean, you know, you have to live and learn and adjust. So we, you know, we're trying to um, not 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 downsize down, down the business to like a more to go friendly concept. That way, I mean, God forbid another pandemic hits like this, we you know we're more prepared and um we can actually utilize the whole space. So we have a lot of empty space for people who aren't really feel comfortable to come in and eat, but if we still have to pay the rent for it. So, I mean, that's been the, the biggest impact, but there has been a lot of um, support, you know, of, um a lot of small business grant resources available that we, you know, we took advantage of. And um, we, uh, we went through the PPP on um, the payroll protection plan. So we kept people employed, we hired people, created, another 40, 40 jobs, another 40 people on payroll. So uh, we're just, just being smart, taking our time, following the rules, not rushing everything. And just you know, really practice the social distancing and um, everything that they ask for through the city, because that's the only way we can get through this is by following the rules. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, Giuseppe, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, thanks, Jeff. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty accurate, everything that you said. Um, for, for us, um, we, uh, we've pretty much been, uh, on a hard swim against concurrent, uh, this whole time. Uh, you know, we changed a few things, uh, with COVID-19, um, you know, we had to change our menus more to like a family style menu. So people can come in and just pick one person can come in and pick up food for like the whole family. Uh, that's one thing we, we ended up donating over 10,000 meals. Uh, we had our own GoFundMe page for the front uh, frontliners uh, workers. Uh, we donated over 10,000 meals over uh, 15 um, hospitals in the DMV area. You know, we partnered up with with the people that followed us throughout the last seven years. They were able to donate money to our GoFundMe. Uh, we were able to um, partner up with other organizations like World Central Kitchen. Uh, we were able to donate food, uh, food like that too. So we kept a lot of people employed. We, uh, we hire more people. We ended up opening another place in Crystal City. It's just, it, it, we're just in a different situation uh, because of the pandemic. And we've been literally just swimming really hard against the current, you know, picking our head up, seeing where we are, uh, and then coming up with, uh, with plan B and then doing it again, and then coming up with plan C and then doing it again. So it's, 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 been, it's been a great, it's been a, it's, it's a, we're all in a bad situation right now especially the restaurant owners that, you know, we, we had our grand opening February 1st, and then a month later it hit us hard, but it's, it's a learning position for all of us. It's, it's a time for, for, for us to, to really come close together as a team and say, you know, we have to have the highest quality of food in order for a few people that are coming out to make sure they're coming out to the restaurant and make sure they feel safe. Like just uh, you know, following the, all, all, all the CDC regulations and making sure people that, know that we're doing whatever we can to, to to not add to the problem of getting the curve going up and actually flatten the curve or, or even better bringing it down. But it's 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 a thing that and with all the resources that we've been getting, uh, we've been trying also to take advantage of them. But you know sometimes you get sometimes you get the grants, sometimes you don't get the grants. Um, uh, and it's it's a thing that you know it's we're gonna we're gonna go see we're gonna see how this situation goes, you know here now in three months, now in six months when the middle of the winter is here. And we're just gonna keep, you know, 
bouncing from side to side, trying to trying to keep forward. Thanks, Giuseppe and Jeff, for both sharing your experiences. Um, I'm glad um, you've uh, you've been able to adapt, and it sounds like it's been incredibly challenging. Um, for the CDFIs, how has the public health emergency affected the support that you've um, been providing to small businesses? Um, I know we've talked about this a little bit, but anything additional you wanted to share that you haven't had an opportunity to share yet? Um, why don't we start with Daniel? Thank you. Um, yeah, well, uh, LEDC uh, definitely partnering with the, the deputy mayor to disperse uh, micro grants um, that I think have been mentioned already. Um, you know, we are still doing PPP, um, but we've dispersed uh, just under 2 million so far. And I just looked in about one third of the, um, those businesses and also similarly like the like 800,000 over that um, has gone to food businesses. So we're definitely focusing on the, you know, that support and PPP, encouraging people to do the economic injury disaster loan. Um, and then, you know, trying to uh, it's focus on the TA portion and see what might be available with other, you know, loan products that, that we have at our disposal. But um, the community economic development program that I uh, mentioned earlier, where we're able to loan at 0% uh, interest for job creation, we just submitted um, another grant proposal to be funded a fourth year, and this would allow us to also fund uh, the restoration of those types of jobs. So as like an add-on to, you know, PPP, if that didn't cover it fully or in another scenario, you know, this PPP is very much they're becoming more flexible, but it is very much targeted to the payroll particularly, whereas the CED program is more broad in that as long as it ends up with the jobs, um, it's an allowable uh, project, like if it's, you know, renovating the space or buying equipment or all th these other uses of funds that allow for the job creation as the end goal, we're able to work with that. So we're hoping to, to get that funding available uh, next fiscal year, so October 1st. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of, of what we're doing beyond uh, the TA and those federal programs that we have and local programs. Thanks, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Lou, did you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey, um, so we essentially, I guess, across the board, uh, we also, of course, uh, administered uh, the DC micro grant, um, deployed a bit over $2 million owners mostly uh they were restaurants and um just... hello go ahead i think someone was just unmuted for a sec okay um and mostly just as uh jeff and uh giuseppe mentioned um <clears throat> the restaurant uh industry uh or food-based uh, businesses in general but specifically restaurants um from a from a technical assistance capacity or, 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 or a viewpoint, we're having to coach them around pivoting and um, within this environment, how they can expand uh, their service offering and figure out different ways to deliver their products or services into the hands of their customers. Uh, also how to keep their customers uh, informed of uh, how to uh, patronize them. Also, um, we really take a deep, hard look into how they can change their product offering to um, sell uh, via different methods. So, of course, if they were retailing or selling to uh, B2C directly to their consumers, maybe they can now package some of their more uh, popular items and attempt to uh, sell those at uh, different uh, grocery stores or other uh, online retailers where they can sell their products in different methods uh, to a different type of customer or in different quantities to increase their average sale. Uh, so during this time, we um, just spend a lot of our um, time uh, looking at how uh, business owners are able to uh, reposition themselves to not only deal with this current crisis, but of course, as we all see in the news, um, this may uh, come back on us even harder within the next three or four months. And so it's really part of the developing a disaster resiliency plan, if you will, uh, to make sure that if uh, this, this happens again, you're prepared and you can switch modes right away. Um, and 
I mean, let's be honest, uh, some of the things that they're going to come up with uh, during this time will stick with them. And of course, if, if you have developed uh, different pathways of delivering your products and services, uh, then those are things you can keep with you and utilize even when we're not experiencing a pandemic. So, you know, just a, a few items as to how we're going about coaching our clients at this point in time. And I think everyone should take a strong, hard look at how to incorporate that into their companies as well. Thanks, Lou. Um, I want to make sure to hit on um, a few of the other questions that have come through. Um, there was a question about a large commercial, um, I think um, you use the term commercial, large commercial scale facility. Um, I think the idea here would be like a um, large commercial um, kitchen facility for, for entrepreneurs to be able to use. Um, I, we have four, I believe, operating in DC right now, commercial kitchens. Um, but um, agreed with Olivia's comment that um, this is probably like the most frequent um, need that we hear among um, small food entrepreneurs is um, access to more affordable commercial kitchen space. Um, I did want to mention that um, our office, the um, DC Food Policy um, Council within Office of Planning is currently working on a centralized kitchen study um, that should be out this fall. Um, and includes uh, will include some best practices and recommendations for the city on um, developing a centralized kitchen. Um, but also wanted to see if the CDFIs wanted to talk at all to um, the need that you hear for commercial kitchen space and any work you're doing in that area. Uh, sure, this is Olivia, I think. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, this is an ongoing need. There's high demand for production space, um, but it would be, um, we would need to identify an existing operator of a kitchen space that was interested in expanding. It certainly is challenging and a um, multi-million dollar effort um, to build out such a large facility. Um, but we have done it before in other, in other cities and has supported um, both large and small, you know, I think of an example in Detroit that was um, appropriate for about three producers and we financed the um, acquisition build out of some manufacturing manufacturing space for processors. That might have been a total of two or three hundred thousand dollars to build out the space for three entrepreneurs. But then we have on the opposite side, a much larger scale facility that built out up to 55 separate standalone um, production spaces, um, as well as a huge shared uh, shared facility um, for production labeling, packing, and distribution. Um, that was about a 30 to 40,000 square foot facility, and the project was probably 16 or 18 million dollars, and that was in LA. Um, so there are different sizes of production facilities that we can imagine. As Ona mentioned, there are a couple in the region already, and I have heard of a couple that are in expansion mode, so building out more spaces. Um, but I think this is an ongoing need uh, that we see nationwide. Thanks, Olivia. Um, for the um, business owners, um, we got a question about um, how you see COVID-19 affecting your business. Um, and um, I wanna read it, I'll just read it. I don't like paraphrasing. Um, as we go through this health emergency, please comment on what you're thinking about as you look forward uh, six, four, six, um, 12 months from now. And do you see any specific opportunities or, or any advice you have for, um, for other business owners? That was my add-in. Um, Giuseppe, um, are you still with us and can you start? Yes. Um, well, to be uh, to be quite honest, it's you, we just have to keep reinventing myself. I've talked to um, I've talked to many friends that are restaurant owners in Italy in uh, France, and they, it's the same thing. Like you have to see how you can be able to transport your your product to somebody's house and keep the quality up as as well as possible be able to market yourself out there through social media, uh, email blasts and things like that to be able to get the word of what you're doing out there. You know, uh, everything is moving really fast right now. 
So you just have to make sure that you stay on top of your opening hours and letting people communicate is key here. Uh, you can have the best product, you have the, you can have the best delivery, but if people don't know that you're doing it, then your salesmen are gonna, uh, uh, they're gonna take a lot longer than in usual circumstances for your sales to go up. Thanks, Giuseppe. Um, Jeff? Sorry about that, guys. Uh, my my store, store has called me about three times in a row. So can you re repeat the question? I'm sorry. Of course. No, no worries. Um, the question was um, where you see your business going for six or 12 months from now, um, how you see yourself continuing to adapt, and any advice you have for other small business owners. Uh, well, I see my business, you know, continue, you know, of course, to hopefully continue to grow. Um, but we're starting to look at um, business within you know, see um, Montgomery County as well. Um, we have a lot of concepts that we're working on. We're just being smart and taking our time, and um, you know, just being the main thing, like you said, is the lease negotiation, making sure these landlords understand what's going on because um, prime real estate is. I mean, real estate in the district is, is, is not cheap. And we all know that this, these properties, they afford it. So it has to be a teamwork. The landlord has to be willing to work with the tenant. Um, and just like you said, just downsizing social media, like just said, we said, social media marketing, downsizing. We did a lot of, um, uh, the first the first day of the pandemic, we, uh, we um, up until now, we fed DC uh, public school uh, kids free, uh, free, uh, free meals every single day because we know they depend on that. Um, the school since they depend on that, that that free lunch that they get. So it's about social recognition, doing your part in the community and just taking, you know, really downsizing, you know, as we expand and looking for spaces that are small, uh, you know, smaller than what we were used to, just in case, you know, something like, like I said, happen like this happens again. We're just, you know, we just know that we don't have that huge overhead. So it's just about, you know, young entrepreneurs have to do their research. They um, have to take their time. They have to budget and they have to listen. They have to um, take advice and criticism and really learn from it because you know it's a life-changing event and if you don't follow the rules and the procedures and actually listen to people it could really um have a huge effect on your life so um and growing a team so we have you know we're growing a team we're family on we're family owned but we have people that's been employed with us for six seven years and they're still there to this day and then so we put trust in our our staff and our team members and that's how we're uh, able to continue to grow Awesome. Thanks, um, both of you, um, to your, um, for your responses on that. Um, I wanted to um, turn it over to the DSLBD folks to see if there's any questions that have come up that we haven't addressed um, before um, we hit 1130. Uh, we've been covering them all, all along. The most recent question that's come up is talking about bridging multiple CDFI loans um, or products to finance larger products. And how would somebody go up to the process? Hi, this is Olivia at Capital Impact. I think I did see the message or the note from Eightfold Farms uh, about various multiple CDFIs partnering on one project. Now, usually you start with one and then they, um, you might be referred to and based on their, um, their glimpse of the financial need, they will access other partners um, as they feel um, is appropriate for that particular transaction. So I suggest starting with one, any one of us here would be happy to chat about the project. I don't know where it is and what size it is, but um, I think starting with one and then suggesting to your lender partner that um, they engage with other lenders if, 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 if it makes sense, as it makes sense. Thank you so much. Any other questions, um, DSLBD? None that have come through. Okay. Um, I did see a comment about cooperative ownership. Um, man, could we spend another 90 minutes on this, um, <laughs> especially in the food space, you know, just to name that cooperatives take lots of different forms. There's cooperatives that are owned by their workers. There are um, food purchasing cooperatives. There are agricultural co cooperatives. Um, and this is inspiring me to maybe have a follow-up event. Um, I will just speak for them maybe in our last few minutes and say that I think all of the CDFIs on this call would be open to talking to any um, anyone interested in starting a cooperative. I know there's deep expertise in many of their staffs um, on, cooperative, um, on cooperative ownership and cooperative business models. So um, 
yes, yes to everything everyone's saying. Um, I do want to note the time. It's um, 1128. Um, I want to give the panelists an opportunity. Um, I won't call on you, but any like burning last thoughts that you wanted to get out before we all sign off. I'll just go ahead and jump in. I just placed in the chat a little bit of information about a partnership between Capital Impact Partners and WACIF that we launched an inaugural cooperative award. Two of those um, cooperatives that we're supporting are, are, are food specific. Um, I also just wanted to underscore how we definitely believe that our work in food systems is complex, but it affords us the opportunity to deliver healthy, affordable, relevant food in the communities that have been lacking it for so long. And as a couple of our business owners stated earlier, it creates a career pathway and a pathway to entrepreneurial wealth that I think is really critical that we support in order to address this very stubborn thing called the racial wealth gap that continues to exist in our country. Great, any other panelists wanna chime in? Thanks for naming that, Olivia. Um, we are, I just wanna thank our panelists again. This was such a rich conversation with so much information um, that I'm really glad we'll have recorded because it will take a while to digest. We'll be sending out a follow-up um, email with more resources um, after this call. And thank you for everyone for sticking with us for 90 minutes. Um, I hope um, you got something out of this. Um, Thank you, guys. This Enjoy. was wonderful. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.